Привет, ты сталкер! What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? I said come in, don't just stand there. If you like that, then you're gonna love the rest of this video. And remember, don't get out of here until you like, comment, and subscribe. Stalker Clear Sky is a first-person survival horror game from Ukrainian developer GSC Game World and published by Deep Silver for PC in 2008. This game acts as a prequel to their game Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, which was released one year prior. Well, just in case you're some kind of wild card that isn't aware of this game's chronological sequel, Shadow of Chernobyl was a game not unlike this game, where, in an alternate history timeline, a second Chernobyl disaster created a hostile and supernaturally altered zone, which many different groups of people want to use use, explore, or exploit for a number of reasons, financial, scientific, and personal. Since this is a video about that game's prequel, I'm just gonna go ahead and say general spoiler warning for Shadow of Chernobyl. I don't want to get caught up recounting things from that game. What am I, clear sky? Ha! That's a joke, that'll maybe make more sense later. But anyway, I'll warn you before major spoilers for clear sky though. I'm not a monster. My name's Scar. In Shadow of Chernobyl, we played as a stalker, a morally ambiguous adventurer, thief type that trespasses into the zone in search of artifacts, these strange objects created by the zone that are imbued with supernatural properties. That game's development was fraught with conflict and confusion. It was essentially built on an impossible promise and for a while thought to be vaporware. In the six years between announcement and release, two Splinter Studios were formed, spawning two game series that each differently reflect what the respective GSC deserters wanted out of this project. In the wake of numerous delays and setbacks, their first publisher, THQ, made an attempt to hasten the fledgling dev team, which of course included cutting numerous aspects of the game, and in some cases leaving them broken or unfinished. The result was a pretty divisive game that failed to make good on its grander promises, but was thankfully redeemed by a stellar atmosphere and tense gameplay unlike anything else, beautifully rendering a sickly, old, dying world full of cruel people eager to make it even worse if it means more money. Even with its myriad issues, bugs, crashes, and a storyline GameSpot described as incoherent, the first Stalker game was well received and developed a rabid cult following. It even spawned a recurring urban exploration themed festival called Stalkerfest, with Q&As, what looks like a costume contest, musical guests, and some kind of interpretive dance stunt show. Looks like it would smell a little better than an anime convention. GSC founder Sergei Grigorovich hopped on the mic to do a cover of Sweet Dreams. Sweet dreams are made of this. Who am I to disagree? Like, is it just me or is he somehow a million percent more relatable right now? I just feel like I'm one step closer to getting him. And I almost forgive him for creating such a divided workplace on Shadow of Chernobyl. <laughs> Work quickly began on the game's follow-up, then titled Stalker Anarchy Cell, which was meant to fill in some of the story gaps left in Shadow of Chernobyl, with the twist being you don't play as Strelok, the first game's amnesiac protagonist, but instead as a mercenary with designs to stop him, an idea borrowed from the Half-Life expansion Opposing Force. But more importantly, they want wanted to make good on many of the game design promises from Shadow of Chernobyl, like its A-Life AI system, the way the game was meant to simulate routines and patterns in NPCs and enemies. In an ideal outcome of this concept, every other stalker in the game would be capable of everything the protagonist is capable of, meaning that presumably some random NPC could disable the brain scorcher and get to the center of the zone before you, something that was touted a great deal during the first game's development. But ultimately, one of the things that was short shrifted after proving to be a quagmire, a money and time sink that they couldn't get right before the game went gold. Clear Sky began as an attempt to see this dream through, which shouldn't be the way this industry works, uh, but I suppose I can respect making the same game over and over until you get it right. Just kind of wish that happened in the office and uh, preceded the game's actual release. I'm not certain I have the timeline down correctly, but if the day 
made on these videos of Clear Sky being shown at E3 2007 are correct, then that would mean a few months after Shadow of Chernobyl was released, GSC already had a playable build of Clear Sky. It could also be that the Lemansk Hospital scene was part of the cut content from Shadow of Chernobyl, so that's why it was the only part of the game uh, they seemed to show. Who's to say? 2007 was an immeasurable amount of time ago. I think more than ever we've just become dislodged from time, noting its passage with only the accumulation of Mountain Dew Kickstart orange citrus cans that occupy my desk. Even with another shaky release, the game was received well enough critically. Certainly, if a critic assigned it a numeric value, it was respectable, but it's kind of funny seeing a repeat of many of the same sentiments pointed at the previous game. This mysterious infatuation in the face of an incomplete mess. <laughs> That's embarrassing, I'm such a fucking idiot. Yeah, the first time I tried to play this, I thought that, that my inventory was the dead guy's inventory, so I just gave this dead asshole all my shit. Ow! Being vocally disappointed in the game's execution, yet finding its world and ambience undeniably compelling. Even if the content of the article is 80 or 90% harsh criticism, you sense that, almost out of admiration for the previous game's effort, they're holding back. Because the actual content of them implies a much lower score. Yep, st still haven't noticed I'm doing that. Well, later on, I'm probably gonna be like, where's all my stuff? I <laughs> started the game with so much shit and now I have fucking nothing, dude. Clear Sky underwent very few changes from its original design, as they already had the foundation of their game built and spent most of its year in production tweaking their engine to something more closely, approximating their original idea back when Shadow of Chernobyl was called Oblivion Lost. Back when Stalker was just a twinkling, empty promise in someone's eyes. Despite the confidence on display with the game's turnaround, it was similarly plagued with game-breaking bugs on release. It turns out, a buggy Ukrainian game, Windows Vista, and unwieldy copy protection made for a dangerous mix, and after several patches, both official and community made, the game still struggles in many ways. There are a few ways you can view this. One, as abject failure, and two, Slavic magic. That unquantifiable, fascinating jank that only they have the secret recipe for. Which is special and remarkable in how you just can't recreate it. Like the footage I used in my previous Stalker video, this is a mostly vanilla copy with only one mod in place. The impression I wanted reflected in the video is as close as I can get to the game that was released by GSC Game World, uh, but I'd like it to also be stable and playable. I know their marketing director likes to describe this series as hardcore and not being for non-intellectuals, but I really feel like that challenge should be retained within the game, so I employed the use of a single community bug fix called Sky Reclamation Project, and just like the last one, I found myself questioning whether or not it had even properly installed. Clear Sky takes place about a year before the events of Shadow of Chernobyl, a year before Strelok's third and final attempt at making it to the center of the zone. It opens with a mercenary named Scar leading a group of scientists through the zone, when there is a massive blowout, a release of psychic energy from the Noosphere that is lethal to anyone not protected from it. Oh, that's right, fuck. Okay, look, on the off chance you didn't know what that was, in short, the Noosphere is a sphere of energy that surrounds the Earth and is created by the combined consciousness of every living thing on it. A group of scientists working in secret after the fall of the Soviet Union managed to combine their minds into one entity called Sea Consciousness and manipulate the Noosphere uh, in hopes of creating like world peace or some shit. But in doing so, uh, they fucked it up and created the Zone. One of its many hazards is that it regularly sort of vents excess energy, which kills most things within an ever-increasing radius from the center of the Zone. This is a concept that was used narratively in Shadow of Chernobyl, but in Clear Sky they appear to happen more frequently and are part of regular gameplay, or might be depending on how bugged your playthrough proves to be. This has been admitted as a goof on their part, they meant to have them in that game but didn't have time to implement them until this iteration. Anyway, the important part of this is, Scar was able to survive the effects of a blowout, which until then was thought to be impossible. He wakes up in the base of a secretive science 
scientific military outfit called Clear Sky, one of the first factions to populate the zone, as they were formed from a divide in the group of scientists that made up sea consciousness. They've instead devoted themselves to figuring out how to repair the noosphere and live with the zone, seeing it in a similar way to the ecologists and freedom as a sort of gift or wonder for humanity to share and learn from. Though Scar displays some kind of powerful resilience to the zone's emissions, they learn that they are also slowly eating away at his immune system, so he will likely die if they continue to increase in frequency, and they theorize that so too will uh, all the other stalkers. The Clear Sky leader, Lebedev, concludes that the increase in emissions must be the result of stalkers getting close to the zone's center, where they are sort of consumed by it, making the zone grow, both in size and volatility. So as Scar, we are sent out to track down whatever group has been making repeat trips to the center. You can probably guess what group that is, but we'll just carry on as if you don't. The first step in this investigation leads us back to the Cordon and Sidor the traitor that helps out Strelok for most of Shadow of Chernobyl. In exchange for the information he knows, he makes Scar deal with a deteriorating alliance between the military and a group of loners, stalkers with no faction affiliation. I should mention this game's main plot is much, much shorter than Shadow of Chernobyl's, and that is felt even more so if you choose to ignore all the faction war missions you can get caught up in. You're free to team up with whichever faction you vibe the most with, but there is little in the way of deep lore or world building. It's just another opportunity to get into a big shootout, which is what this game seems to think was the only thing people enjoyed about the first game. I guess now is a, as good a place as any to take a spoiler break, even though I don't know how necessary it is. There is far from any game-changing revelation revealed in Clear Sky. You'll probably have close to the same understanding of the story as you had after the first game, but just as a courtesy and for the sake of uniformity, if you'd like to not learn any late game details about Clear Sky's plot, feel free to skip to this time. And in the meantime, we'll just uh, chill out, uh, maybe take some calls. Go ahead and call the number on the screen now. Just go ahead and give me that call. Put you on the air. You know. Just give me a call. Yeah. Bring, bring. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Hello, caller. You're on the air. Ah. Oh, the best video game YouTuber on YouTube? Wow, well, that's incredibly flattering. Uh-huh. I should do more Supernatural videos? <laughs> well, if you say so. <laughs> I think, uh... uh hello? Oh, it's not. Holy shit, I, I I didn't think you would answer. Buddy, it's been, what, six years? It's not, it's not supposed to... We've all been worried about... Sidorovich tells Scar about Strelok's group and that they've been looking around for components to some kind of exotic device. Following very flimsy breadcrumbs about this group, Scar eventually meets up with a dude who worked with somebody from Strelok's team, Fang, someone who we never actually met because they were already dead in the first game. Well, we don't meet him in this game either, but it's interesting, I suppose. I I'm I'm really trying to wring out a plot here, but uh, so you don't find Fang, but you do find some people who robbed Fang. And they have his PDA, which clues you into everyone involved in Strelok's group, and that they have been to the center of the zone and they aim to return and find the Wish Granter, the fabled monolith at the zone center. Lebedev uh, posits that these guys must be who's responsible for all these dangerous emissions, and gives Scar the grim task that Strelok himself is soon to be given, kill the Strelok. Scar heads out to their last noted destination, the Agriprom Research Institute. Hey, this place seems familiar. It's interesting that Clear Sky starts this game off with something of an incorrect hypothesis. They think the sole cause of emissions is human interference with the zone's center, a result of the zone fighting off intruders, using blowouts like white blood cells to sentiently protect whatever is at its center, which while sea consciousness is still alive, might be partially true. Emissions are likely used both out of necessity and strategically, but I'm guessing Clear Sky splintered away from the Chernobyl scientist before learning all about the Noosphere and the zone being caused 
because of tampering with it and it needing to release built up energy after they fucked up reality because they put a lot of stock into this mission to stop Straylock. As if once he's out of the picture, the blowouts will stop. When the truth is they don't know what's going to happen if you get to the center. They still have a sort of whimsical idealization of what the zone is. It seems like such a pointless and doomed mission to base this entire game around because there's no mention of Clear Sky in Shadow of Chernobyl. It's not like they're remembered for this conflict, which just confuses me, I guess. This confusion I had with the new faction and their motives is one of many plot points in this game that has me wondering who it's for. Oleg and crew often parroted the sentiment that the game was both meant to address Shadow of Chernobyl's unanswered questions, but also as a game that people could pick up without playing the other one. If you remember the first game, we played uh, as a Strelok guy who, who, who didn't, didn't uh, actually remember his Strelok, but... Uh, Spoilers, uh, Valentin! Uh, <laughs> this game came out like two days ago, come on! I can never stay yeah, mad at you. But I think they may have pandered a bit more towards that second audience, because in reality, I would think it much, much easier to dream up a prequel to Shadow of Chernobyl than it is to dream up a sequel. They kind of shot their shot with that story, and sure, there's plenty you could still do, but I don't know if that's something you could figure out in under a year. Clear Sky is largely a retread of the first game that shows off some new levels along the way. See, in Shadow of Chernobyl, we're playing as Straylock, who doesn't know that he is Straylock. He lost his memory, so he's looking for this guy named Straylock, unknowingly doubling over his own footsteps. Kind of weird that he's essentially going to a bunch of places he's already been, asking people if they've seen him, and they just shrug their shoulders, but that's besides the point. In this game, we have a new character, yes, but we're still for the most part following the same path that Straylock took. It's just happening a little more actively. We keep just missing him. It will deviate every now and then in that he'll go one way, and we'll find some secondary means of catching up to him, but many of the same beats are still hit. We work for Sidorovich, we go beneath the Agriprom Research Center, where we find a PDA in Strelok's hideout, then we go to Yantar and help Professor Sakharov do some shit so people's brains won't melt. Obviously by now the professor has already met Strelok and given him the prototype psychic helmet device, so you just go through the motions of this kind of mission without it having the same story significance. And all this so you can catch up to Strelok at the nuclear power plant and run through portals and mow down hordes of monolith soldiers. Yeah, I, I played this game before I played this game. Sakharov tells you that he still has a GPS signal for the Psy device he gave Straylock, and it's picking up his signal in the Red Forest. Which if you're unfamiliar with some of this game's parallels to the actual Chernobyl disaster, the Red Forest is an area of about 10 kilometers around the power plant that was hit with such a powerful concentrated dose of radiation that the trees died and turned a red-brown color. Even after being bulldozed as part of the cleanup process, it remains one of the most radioactive areas. Then again, and the citation for that hasn't been updated since 2006, so maybe all these years and at least two wildfires have calmed it down a bit. Still probably, uh, probably wouldn't want to, I don't know, forget freaking make out there dude <laughs> I don't know that. before we make it to the forest we get the briefest glimpse of straylock and holy shit that fucker can move 1v1 me bitch i'm fast as fuck boy i guess he anticipated this because he runs across a bridge blows up the tunnel that would have been a straight path to the power plant and sends a squad of hired loners after you how he knows who you are and that you intend to stop him from going to the center i don't know but if you're anything like me you've probably lost interest in the plot by now. It's here we meet a new character named Forrester, who is probably the most intriguing character in this game. Maybe both games. Maybe this game should have been about him. Maybe I love him. Nah, I, I don't know what love is. I think I just want to freaking make out or something. <laughs> I, I don't know what this new bit I've invented is. <laughs> this guy's been here since before the first disaster and has somehow developed an uncanny ability to navigate through the zone. He truly has some kind of strange communion with it, almost like it answers his prayers in a way. It's really interesting, and it's appropriately left unanswered and unexplained. Forrester helps you save a group of freedom stalkers that have become trapped in a spatial anomaly, a delightful addition to the horrors that the zone throws at you. They are essentially stuck in one area of the forest in a loop, entering invisible portals that send them back to the starting point. That's just fun. I like the creepier sci-fi elements to the story, and this whole part of the game really shines a light on how uncreepy 
this game is as a whole. This is sort of the only moment you get like this, where it feels like a survival horror game. Oh, hey guys. Uh... Oh, oh, okay. Can we stop at McDonald's? Chicken become. Trust me, I like to shoot a man, but sometimes there's just too many mans to shoot, and I get bored of shoot a man. This all works out rather serendipitously as the Freedom Squad emerges from the anomaly on the other side of the raised drawbridge where Straylock escaped. So Clear Sky mobilizes to provide them with cover as they lower the bridge, which is currently under bandit control. With the more dangerous route that Straylock took destroyed, Scar and Clear Sky make for the scenic route through the town of Lamance. Much like the first game, by now we are at the point of no return. It's gonna be non-stop until the end as Scar and Clear Sky are immediately met with heavy monolith resistance, the army of brainwashed ex-stalkers that fight to protect the zone's center. The fighting is pretty relentless from here on. It essentially becomes a corridor shooter, and there's even a part where you gotta shoot a helicopter, which I did with this pistol, and they were nice enough to let me take my time. Oops, I got a little, a little jam there. Hang on. Alrighty. Oh, uh, just another little jam. Alright. Well, how do you like that? When they get close enough, Clear Sky just stays behind to hold them off, so Scar can go for the power plant and stop Straylock. Lebedev gives Scar an electromagnetic pulse rifle, which he has to use on Straylock, to disrupt the Psy armor he got from Sakharov. Without it, Straylock will be quickly overwhelmed by the intense Psy energy when he tries to enter the sarcophagus, the big scary tube where the monolith is said to be. I don't know if this was a glitch, but this is this is what it looked like. It's kind of, kind of weird. Anyway, once we successfully disable Straylock's psychic helmet thing, Clear Sky has about a half second to celebrate before they realize the futility of this mission, and the area is hit with a massive blowout with readings that are off the charts. Everyone, save for the monolith soldiers, feels the effect of the emissions and either dies or is zombified, effectively wiping out Clear Sky entirely, and presumably Scar along with them, as he was already not long for this world. But unlike Shadow of Chernobyl, Clear Sky has one possible ending cutscene and it depicts a corridor inside the power plant lined with bodies being brainwashed by sea consciousness, including our boy, the marked one, the cheeky breaky man, he who would not get out of here, stalker, he who dared to just stand there and not come in, the unwrapped mummy himself, setting the stage for the events of this game's sequel. I like this final cutscene, and I like how grim the ending of this game is. It really is just everyone dies slowly and horrifically, and then the de facto villain, I guess, gets brainwashed too hard hunt and kill himself by a bunch of brains in jars. I can't say I'm crazy about the execution and most of what led up to it. Couldn't really say it's earned, but I guess I'm just a sucker for a bummer ending. <coughs> I don't think Clear Sky has a good story. I guess to some extent neither did Shadow of Chernobyl, but there was a lot of it. There was this messy, tangled ball of sci-fi schlock that was aided by some incredibly strong visual storytelling and atmosphere. If anything, I appreciate it a lot more now that it's been paired with this game's story. Honestly, I'm not really sure what actually was left to explore with the story of Strelok. I understand that he had tried to get to the center of the zone before and failed. Does knowing the specifics of this develop or reveal character? Does it build on the game's world? I don't think there is any aspect of Clear Sky's story that is so importantly intertwined with Shadow of Chernobyl that you couldn't just snip it out of the canon and have there be no effect. The most substantial revelation, I think, is that Clear Sky as a group existed, which is not not necessary but noteworthy. This is not to say I think all the ideas it comes up with are bad, it makes some fun additions to the lore, like spatial anomalies and red forest and we get to hang out by the Duga radar, and there's like a little bit of lore about how they were using it to manipulate the citizens of Lemansk. It's like a tenth of its size, but it's, it's I recognized it, and I thought that that was sweet. There's a part where you have to escape a tunnel before it floods, and you see a bunch of tiny mutants fleeing in the opposite direction, like in the flashback sequences in the first game. There's plenty that is downright lovely. I, I disassociated through much of the experience of playing this game, and 
and it honestly feels manipulative. But when the game decides to explore something new, I'm right there again because I fucking really like Sock. Getting tired of saying the full title. It's Sock. It's Sock and Kiss. I just fundamentally don't see the point of this story. I wouldn't be surprised if secretly this game exists because they just wanted a second crack at making Oblivion Lost. The things they felt it necessary to get hard answers for are only things I couldn't give a fuck about. Like I already got that it happened. I was told an approximation of this off-screen event and I got it. Thumbs up. Let's do this. Leroy. The thing we didn't know was that, well, the first couple times he tried to get at the monolith, it played out much the same way, except he didn't make it those times. Holy shit, dude, are you serious? Part of me feels like I'm being overly critical, but part of me thinks I give them a lot of passes. There's a lot of plot details that I think I'm subconsciously head cannoning away, and, and they probably just, they didn't even fucking know. They just messed up and like contradicted their own lore and I, I give them the benefit of the doubt. We know Straylock has attempted to get to the monolith three times. We had a whole game about the third time. The, the one time that mattered, the one time that had any significant effect on the zone. So why would your instinct be to explore the failed attempt of the second trip through the eyes of someone who doesn't even see this fucking guy for the whole story? The quote-unquote unanswered questions from Shadow of Chernobyl, for me, were all character related. Because you dumped all the info you could have about the zone, so instinctively I would think a prequel would explore those fragmented flashbacks we see. I, I figured we'd explore that early relationship between Straylock and this doctor guy. It's It seems like they have significant history. It seems like Straylock has history. The game paints him as this mythical figure, but doesn't really explain why. I'd figure you'd take this opportunity to say something smaller scale that would affect the biggest story you could have told, which you already told. You know, a small thing that would add more significance to that story. But instead, it seems they tried to match the scale and significance of it, which is nullified when you realize that nobody in the story is really remembered. All this conflict and life lost is in service to this guy getting brainwashed. That's the only significant thing that results from all of the actions here. Uh, at, at this point, I'm just repeating myself, but you gotta give me a hook. You gotta give me a dead girlfriend, a dead boyfriend, a daddy hates, and not like a Chernobylite girlfriend that shows up every five seconds to whisper ASMR exposition. I, I get it, dude. You had a girlfriend, okay? We all get that you fuck. I just mean an emotional core. Let me know Straylock is more than a G.I. Joe action figure man. Yeah, it doesn't have to be clever. Just anything to hold on to. Can you, can you help me with that? I, I'm so lonely. Much of Clear Sky's changes were focused on its gameplay and addressing the feedback they got from Shadow of Chernobyl. For better and worse, it still plays in much the same way that game does. Uh, one of the most anomalous things about Shadow of Chernobyl is its gameplay. It is all at once engaging, immersive, baffling, frustrating, and annoying, delightful and empowering, yet miserable and demoralizing. It fucking sucks. I love it. Well, like that game, this is still an open-world first-person shooter with with RPG elements taking place across a hazardous, violent, post-apocalyptic-like Ukraine filled with toxic radiation, packs of wild mutants, anomalies that make you implode, set on fire, or electrify, and roving gangs of warring stalkers. There is, however, a much heavier emphasis on that last one. The faction warfare that made up a small but enjoyable part of Shadow of Chernobyl is now a large part of the makeup of this show. Game. <laughs> it's happening. I'm developing a channel identity crisis. Am I the supernatural channel or am I the video game channel? Only time will tell. Look, you and I both know there's a death clock on those videos. It's gonna be games. That's what's gonna save me. On top of Clear Sky, you can join Duty or Freedom or the Loners or even the Bandits, which is enticing as hell because they do have the best theme song. <laughs> Oh, hell yeah. You can pretty much join anyone except the military who are out to kill any stalkers, regardless of which patch they wear or which absolute banger they bump in their bases. But doing so makes you immediate enemies to whichever group or groups they antagonize. Once you join one of these groups, you work to capture and hold control points around the map. The more you hold, the more resources and manpower you have in the continuing fight. Doing this benefits you in that you get special rewards for your assistance and you get access to certain camps, but that's gonna vary wildly depending on who you join and in some cases uh, can just be more trouble than they're worth. In truth, you don't need to participate 
participate in any of the faction wars. You will have less enemies and an overall easier time traveling, but you will miss out on a lot of rare items. Obviously, when it comes to a stalker game, my experience may have been an outlier, but the entirety of the faction war system it didn't seem like it was working all that well. I'd try to take part in it, but once I defeated all the enemies on a control point, my faction just wouldn't send me back up. So I'd wind up just holding the line for like an hour until I, I gave up. Then like two hours later, I'd be on my way to a distress call in another area and get an update thanking me for taking over that last one that nobody showed up to. Or far more likely, it would just go unacknowledged, and then the next time I return to the area, it's been repopulated by enemies. It's really fucking annoying when they need your help. You'll just be minding your own business trying to enjoy the atmosphere of Stalker when you get a stream of agitated radio transmissions. We're getting squeezed by bandits! Help us out, man, please! They're killing our guys, where are you? Soon, it's gonna be too late, help us! Quick, we're getting slaughtered here! Damn you, where on earth are you? Quick, we're getting slaughtered here! Damn you, where on earth are you? Quick, we're getting slaughtered here! Damn where on earth are you? Thanks for helping out. Renegades are Drop real by our base sometime. Our next we'll up. Thanks for coming to our help. Let's show them who's boss. That's it. Two I'm not on attack repelled. Even when I am helping them, they'll still yell at me to, to like give them commands and stuff. They'll say things like, you know, waiting on your order or uh, we'll fire on your command, but they just do whatever the fuck they want. I'm sure they spent a lot of time on this and were proud of the result, but its implementation is just as buggy as everything else. That's a big piece of programming to add to this Gordian knot of a game. And it's admirable, but not only do I think it has too many still prevalent issues, I think it betrays a lot of what made Shadow of Chernobyl work. You plot out who you're gonna help because all your enemies are depicted on your map. So even if you have no intention of going near them, you see groups of bandits and even mutants, so you can just as easily avoid them entirely. I feel like that kills a lot of surprise and mystery that this world used to have. You didn't know what was gonna be around the corner, and now you kinda always do. It's not really conductive to the survival horror aspect of Stalker, which was working really well before. And with the focus on action wars, you're gonna be spending most of your time with a group of dudes shooting at a group of dudes, which I can see the fun in, but I preferred when this was mixed into other activities. It sorta encourages the feeling that you have to keep moving and helping people, and that works against my desire to take my time exploring. The adjustments made to combat makes all this extra combat feel far more punishing and less fair. The first Stalker is an incredibly difficult game, but I feel like I understood why it was. There are little quirks in the mechanics of this one that I don't get, and they upset me. I think there is a degree of skill you develop playing Stalker, where it's still really fucking hard, but when you die, you sort of learn a lesson from it. <laughs> These motherfuckers are in for a nasty surprise. In Clear Sky, there are things that I can't believe they playtested and said, hell yeah, this game is better now. Firstly, Taking cover in this game when you're in a group is nearly impossible. The AI of your teammates knows to take cover during firefights, but they in no way acknowledge you and your similar desire to take cover. So instead of clipping through you to do the same thing, they just shove you out of the way and out from cover, where you're likely to just catch a stray bullet and immediately die. I would even attempt to mitigate this by falling back and taking cover further away from them, and it would still happen. It was a consistent annoyance that I had to stay as far away from my team as possible because they had no concern for my safety. Something that bothered me a great deal, but I can understand why some could perceive it as an improvement, is how bleeding works. In Shadow of Chernobyl, there were stages of bleeding that you could halt using a bandage. The first stage will drain your health, but it will probably stop by itself, and then it's just increasingly dire for the other two steps. In Clear Sky, if you're hit, it's a coin toss. You're either just hurt, or you're bleeding and immediately in the red, and if you don't have usually more than one bandage, you will bleed out and die. You could take this as realism, but I take it as a needless frustration in an already punishing game. The other clear difference in combat is that the enemy enemies are way more likely to use grenades to flush you out of cover. And they have 
fucking laser guided sight with those things. At a certain point, I just understood if someone yells out, Renata, I don't care how confident I am with my cover, I'm just gonna run. Even with the HUD indicator, you have very little time to react to grenades. And it often feels like the cheapest way to die in this game, which is saying a lot because there's a lot of cheap ways to die. They introduced that to you within the first hour by leading you to this field with a turret at the other end of it. You just have to death by death piece together the way out of this area. And half of getting through this seems like just getting lucky. Because if you're hit, you stop running. It's fucking unacceptable. I need I need to watch someone else's playthrough to vindicate my frustration with this. Get the fuck out of here. As soon as I was out of range of the turret, you're attacked by a pack of dogs. I can easily see how this area could very early on turn away a new player. I think this is one of many thresholds you hit that determine whether or not you're gonna keep playing. To add insult to injury, they offer a route without a turret in it, but only if you enter this area, determine you can't make it through here, and turn back, but nobody is actually telling you that's an option. The game was telling me this is where I needed to go, so why would I think enter Entering here and leaving would magically trigger an alternate route. That's not how games work. I trusted you. How could I know that? The only new addition in combat that feels merciful is that now enemies will sort of stagger when you hit them in certain spots, buying you a split second to finish them off or take cover again. In Shadow of Chernobyl, I had a lot of trouble understanding how iron sights worked. I just didn't seem to be hitting what I was aiming at. And while I was more comfortable with them in this game, uh, weirdly enough, pistols just don't have them for some reason. So my development as a gamer meant nothing to you. <laughs> this time. There is much death in the wasteland. A lot of just odd, slight adjustments that make the game feel like a playground of experiments. Like the way your vision focuses on your weapon as you reload. Which is an interesting idea, as you would be focusing on what your hands are doing while you're reloading, you wouldn't perfectly have one eye on the gun and straight ahead. Not something I'd want in every shooter, but I can appreciate trying things. They must have also figured that the starvation mechanic, or what was left of it, it just didn't need to be there, which I agree with. <laughs> Though it does come back in the next game. The addition of guides is also pretty merciful now that I think about it, but not something I needed. These allow you to pay to fast travel to different points of interest on the map. But for me, it's another thing that discourages exploration and emergent gameplay. Hoofing it everywhere is half the fun. There's an almost meditative quality to it. I imagine this is the same slight euphoria that those who play truck simulator games or things like that must feel. This is where I'm comfortable. This is familiar to me, being afraid of the uncertainty in every step I take. The RPG elements that came in the form of your weapon, armor, and artifact upgrades have all received either an overhaul or a redesign. But like a lot of the changes this game makes, I like the idea of them more so than how they wind up being integrated. Weapons still degrade with use, causing more jams and effects on accuracy. And you can still attach things like scopes or suppressors to them, but now you can also take them to a mechanic that can both repair them and upgrade their barrels and grips if you've got the schematics unlocked. Because of this, the majority of weapons you're gonna find from downed enemies are gonna be nearly useless. I think this was done intentionally so you couldn't make an easy living selling your weapons, because it's only the high quality upgraded ones that are worth anything, and you're unlikely to stumble upon one outside of a quest reward and whatnot. The result is sort of a mixed bag because it does wind up being absurd that areas will be left littered with piles of guns that nobody cares to collect. It's a very un-American sentiment, but somebody, please take my guns. Anybody. They're going to waste out here. They're getting rained on. I do appreciate that this kind of forces you to invest in a long-term relationship with one weapon instead of constantly swapping them out like a looter shooter. But but all these things are, are concepts I can go back and forth on because it's also weird that your enemies are very good at shooting these guns and then you pick it up and it's a piece of shit. They look all cool shooting their guns. You pick it up. You try shooting it a little flag pops out that says you suck you're an idiot they also wanted to encourage you to use the redesigned artifact system in shadow of chernobyl artifacts are not only plentiful but usually sort of laying around out in the open there is rarely anything impeding you from just walking over to it and picking it up aside from maybe a mutant or an anomaly and the puzzle of managing their buffs and debuffs was really enjoyable to me in clear sky artifacts are usually invisible and can only be found using a tracking device that bleeps when 
when you're close to one, but not passively. You have to actually have the device out and be sweeping an area, and you're likely to find it actually inside an anomaly, which requires you to surgically pick it up without being hurt by it. This is a change where I do think the logic behind it is sound. I think it's a creative way to make something that wasn't all that interesting more of a challenge, make it worth more to you. I mean, this, this is kind of the premise of stalkers. They're out here to find artifacts, so it's kind of weird that you wouldn't also be making a living through artifacts. You are a stalker. It all makes sense. It's, it's more gamified, really. The only downside to it, I think, is that it's not really new user friendly. It's like a... Is this an anomaly? One thing I appreciated about Shadow of Chernobyl was that it was good at teaching you how the game worked without patronizing you and leading you through an obnoxious tutorial, and when it did try to do that, it didn't seem like it actually gave a shit if you retained the information. The artifact thing is something that's kind of esoteric, and it's also completely optional. You can go through the whole game never finding a single artifact, and I think that is something worth taking an extra moment to explain. Would have taken all of two minutes, and now you get the importance of it. You can see, oh, this is probably my best way of making money. Where this personally bugs me is that you you just don't come across them very often, and when you do, they don't have that fun give and take with their stats. That balance of equipping the right ones seems far less significant. Probably the biggest reason Clear Sky is often thought of as the black sheep of the series is its emphasis on dude-on-dude -on -dude shooting, and I think that is really regrettable. But that's not to say that this isn't occasionally entertaining. The level design often makes for some memorable shootouts. There's one near the end that takes place in a construction site. It's full of ledges and winding catwalks, which pose a great challenge. And on top of that, at night, it's mostly pitch black except for the occasional flare being shot into the sky, giving you a momentary look at the layout. It's really clever and atmospheric. The moments I have the strongest affinity for in this series are the ones that feel lonely and oppressive, which in the previous game at least were most likely to happen in one of the many underground areas, the bunkers and labs and whatnot, which Clear Sky is sorely lacking. There is at least one, and, and I was living for it. This is my natural habitat. I'm like a little rat, a little gremlin, a ghoulie guy with beady eyes and tiny grabbies, an outcast, a loner, real piece of shit. Blowouts are another new addition to gameplay, but I'm almost positive they didn't work for me. Y'all dropped your beans yet? I think I'm feeling something. I don't think I experienced one of the randomly generated ones, only the ones that were scripted. That is until I started the game over, and then they seem to start working, which is a shame because they are visually very scary and powerful looking. I'd imagine they would have added another layer of tension. That's probably why I didn't even think to mention until now. Because it didn't work. Sure, there are probably several things I've complained about that have been amended by mods, like the still glaring lack of women, which I actually don't trust modders to do anything reasonable with. Stalker was already one of the most beautifully atmospheric games to exist, and there aren't a lot of changes to it visually, but what they do change has a pretty noticeable effect. Advancements to that onerous and curious creation called X-Ray Engine allow for bits of lighting and particle trickery that, while archaic looking now, is not without its charm. Seeing the world of Stalker rendered with volumetric lighting and dynamic wet surfaces is real easy on the eyes. Character models are still one of the more antiquated aspects of the game. They probably could have used a little update, and certainly more variety, but they do have a little more versatility to their animations. They'll hop over obstacles and stuff. Up for you. Holy shit! He moves like they do! But you can also see their feet acclimating to the geometry of whatever they're standing on, which is something even modern games don't really care to find a solution for. These little changes are a welcome but not entirely needed improvement. That's a feeling I had a lot about most aspects of Clear Sky. Because ultimately, most of the things I wanted changed or addressed about Shadow of Chernobyl were left more or less the same, and many of the things I was comfortable with were changed to mixed and often strange results. They didn't do anything to NPCs and their dialogue and your dialogue. It still stuck with this facade of branching conversations, when really it may as well be one button that says talk and then that person spills their guts in a wall of text. Maybe a functioning stealth mechanic? I don't know. But they thought it more important to let bullets pass through trees. That's what this game needs. 
less cover. When I like something that much, I get real protective of any slight change to even the UI. So I often butt it against these. I'm a creature of habit. Unhealthily so. Self-destructively so, you might say. I don't know the specifics of how exactly it was changed, but the day and night cycle seem more dynamic. I'm much more aware of the time of day and the weather, and night specifically is way more atmospheric, way darker, which I think is a great change. Walking around at night was already terrifying, and now that I can barely make out anything past my headlight, it looks fantastic and forces you to become hyper aware of sound. In areas like the Red Forest, this intense dark mixed with some brilliantly effective sound design made for a really eerie experience. Just a light rustling in the bushes or a twig snapping, enough to have you freeze in your tracks or just bolt out of there. And most of the time, it's not even anything. This would again be far more effective if I couldn't just check my map and see if there actually was a mutant nearby. Oh. Oh, hey, look at that. Oh, well, there he is. Voice acting is of similar quality to the previous game, which is technically bad, but it's such a part of this series that I'd hate to see it go. Would you look at that? The little shit cracked like an egg. Are you dumb or something? Piss off. Listen up. Get your ass in gear before I bust the cap in it. Well, you asked for it. I don't think it's as chock full of memeable lines, unless you want to make a thing out of your needy faction asking if you've forgotten about them. They're killing our guys. What are you? We can't hold them, honey. I, and I didn't, okay? I'm hit with a pang of anxiety every time someone contacts me on the radio. It is unignorable. Why do you think I haven't answered my phone or a text message in over three years? Russian composer Vladimir Frey, AKA Moos, is back doing the soundtrack. Well, his music is back. The majority of Clear Sky's soundtrack is actually Shadow of Chernobyl's soundtrack, but that is an excellent soundtrack, so I suppose I shouldn't complain. But I couldn't help but think that a bit lazy. Could have had a whole new soundtrack of beautifully creepy ambience. But what few new tracks this offers are enjoyable, and most of the new ones are from composer Alexei Omolchuk. The track that plays in the new hospital area is particularly tragic and industrial sounding. Another thing I kind of missed out on, uh, mostly because I, did, I just didn't know it was an option and it was turned off by default, is that originally Clear Sky had a sort of dynamic soundtrack where these high energy compositions would kick in during moments of combat. And, and I don't mind listening to them. It's competently written, cheesy, Matrix-adjacent scoring with that mix of orchestra, guitar, and drum and bass. They're fun and sound like nice accompaniment to gunfights. Having said that, they are also wildly out of place in this franchise. Immersion breaking, to say the least, and I can absolutely get why this paired with the abundance of big shootouts would make this already divisive game seem all the more strayed from what most fans loved about it. I love how cold and empty the world of Stalker is, and this is way too modern and exciting for this dead world full of sad people and crumbling ruins, where music that isn't bleak ambience is a, is a beacon of rest. It's a sign that you're somewhere safe, and for a moment, you don't have to worry about what's lurking in every direction. Unless there's a blowout coming. I, I guess you're never really safe. He's dead! He, he died in a fire! There's no dental records, the case is unsolved. Goodbye. Okay, What makes this game so damn good? I mean, this game is amazing. The others were better. But I mean, this is so different, so unique, not turned into crap. Mass Effect 3, Crisis 2, Half-Life 2 Episodes 1 and 2, New Vegas. Okay, some of those are good, but not as good as their prequels. This game is good, get it for $30 or less. The AI are smart, the RPG elements are very well integrated. Warning, this game is scary and creepy. No doubt it is scary as hell, scarier than Dead Space 1 and fear combined. Just amazing. Get it if you want a new game to add to your favorites list. 
My favorite part of this review is, is the blind energy behind it. Just coming in hot and then the unwillingness to condemn all the games you listed. It's incredibly relatable. <laughs> Even when trying to collect my thoughts with this game, it's like I instinctively want to praise it, if anything out of its familiarity, because it shares so many similarities to a game I think is very good. It feels counterintuitive to say it's not all that great. Uh, I, I, I couldn't even do that. Couldn't even do it there. I wanted to be meaner, but that's all I could say. I don't understand why people talk about this game like it is biggest shit they've ever seen play. How much as I can see, no one of them ever passed that great game. Because if they did, things would be different. My personal opinion is that those bugs in game, and there are not so much of them, doesn't matter. If the story and the gameplay are great, there are many details in this game, and they are all awesome, especially weapons. The same thing is about Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. Both games are open world, and you can actually pass it on many, many different ways. All of you who still think that game doesn't worth playing, try passing more than one hour of gameplay. Your defense here is essentially how I would describe Shadow of Chernobyl. It's a strange game that is held back by a lot of bugs and half-implemented ideas. But in that case, I really do think its story and gameplay are redemptive, but not because they're flawless. I think it's the particular way they're flawed that results in a particular alchemy that just kind of works for reasons. I'm not deluding myself that I, I couldn't imagine how one would think differently. You like what you like. I think we both just like different flavors of garbage. From the moment I loaded this game, I was amazed. The great storyline, the atmosphere and immersion. I don't know why people rated this in the mid 70s score. It's clearly an amazing game. Yes, the dialogue is spoken with a broken Russian accent, but surprise, the game is set in Russia. So it adds to the realism. The action is much faster than the first Stalker, the interface is better, the UI is more responsive, and the music is fantastic. Tip. Enable dynamic music in the sound option, and you'll love the battle music. In a way, Clear Sky is what Shadow of Chernobyl should have been. It's a night and day improvement in all aspects of the game, and Clear Sky has beat all my expectations. Well, firstly, the game isn't set in Russia. I know, it's weird. The game about the famous Ukrainian disaster not being set in Russia. What the heck? Uh, but the problem is these things you're describing as its strengths are the things that differentiate it from the game people played a year earlier. The things that make it feel disconnected from that initial experience, which fulfilled a niche more so than something like Clear Sky. We get shoot -a man games non-stop. They literally don't stop making these, but people don't really make what Shadow of Chernobyl was very often. Also, of the long Laundry list of valid complaints people have for this game, I don't think the accents are ever included in that. I don't know, we've got wildly different ideas of what inspires immersion. There is rarely time to be immersed in this game because somebody's yelling at me or somebody's blowing up. Usually me. Got this from Walmart four days prior to the release. No CD key included as there is a major print debacle. Google is your friend. What do I fucking Google? Walmart print debacle? That doesn't bring anything up. I abandon your review because you have sent me on a fool's errand. Wow, this is seriously the best post-apocalyptic game ever, except maybe Fallout 3 when it comes out. Oh, you dear sweet fool, does know what's coming. Oh, it's like that dude from Pompeii that died jerking off. This is probably the best game in the Stalker franchise. Yes, the bugs were there, but Stalker series is bugged as a whole. Clear Sky had a memorable story that even to this day, after six years, I can remember even the tiniest bits. This is a game that is worth playing, but keep in mind, you need to save a lot. It did have a memorable story, I'll give you that. I think I just preferred when it was actually in Shadow of Chernobyl. Fallout for men. Huh. Gross. This is Fallout for real men. Enough said. Absolutely zero women in the game. 10 out of 10. I know I shouldn't have looked at Steam. Not as good as the other Stalker games, but it is still fun. And the Bandit Radio is in the game, which makes it even better. 8 out of 10. Thank you. To some extent, I knew what I was getting into with Clear Sky. I knew this was kind of the outlier of the franchise, but I intentionally tried not to consume any information about it before playing in some flimsy attempt to be pleasantly surprised. But I see now a lot of what I feel is probably the common consensus. There is this weird part of me that doesn't want to just let go and say, I didn't really like this game and I don't think I'll ever revisit it, at least not in this vanilla form. But it's just like, how could I say that? When hours into Shadow of Chernobyl, I was thinking, oh, 
oh, I love this. This is like one of my favorite games now. But minutes into Clear Sky, I was contemplating not even going through with playing it. It's entirely by the merit of that first game that I bothered to work through that first roadblock all the way to the end. Shadow of Chernobyl has a multitude of problems, but I don't think I ever considered just not playing it anymore. Just giving up, whatever's at the end of the rainbow can't be worth the genuine frustration I'm feeling. But I felt that more than once with Clear Sky. It's a real slog before it gets anywhere near the cozy, lovable zone present in the other two games. There was a good while when I had a better weapon and a better grasp of the game's changes where I think I enjoyed it a lot, but by that time I was already on my way to the point of no return where the game is put on rails, and that was not my favorite part of the last game, and I liked it even less in this one because it felt really disjointed for both narrative and gameplay reasons. There's a part where you just spawn at the power plant, and what's-his-face is like, that's a prototype magnetic weapon, and I laughed out loud because it's just like, okay, well how did I get here? And how did I get this? I'm over encumbered now and being shot at. It's like a fucking scene was missing. In Shadow of Chernobyl, you get here by being teleported. Did I teleport here? Does Clear Sky got teleported? There's also just so much reused. I, I began to feel guilty that the things I enjoyed were the parts that were sort of an asset flip. It was just the stuff that was borrowed from another game. It makes me think GSC didn't really want to make a thoughtful addition to their world, more like they wanted a do-over. And they had already written off the first Stalker game as a loss and started working on the next version of it. One closer to an idea they had so long ago by now. But I feel like with Shadow of Chernobyl, they made changes to these ideas and compromises and alterations born out of limitation that resulted in something richly creative. And then in a misguided way, tried to undo these things and retroactively reinstall the concepts they couldn't fit in, when they maybe should have just rolled with what they had because it was actually really good, and if anything just for the sake of symmetry with the series. Of these three games, this one stands out. It's like, oh, I see what you're doing, this is really cool. Oh, so you're not doing that, and now you're splitting the difference. I guess I can live with that. The story is fine, if a little non-existent. I'm just not convinced it provides anything of worth to the lore. It could easily be removed with little effect to anything as it explores something that is just reset at the start of the next game. Uh, sir? I don't want to fault Clear Sky for being hard. I like the difficulty in this series, but this one seems particularly unbalanced. I liked that playing Master difficulty in Shadow of Chernobyl felt challenging, but it felt like I was equally matched with my enemy. They could kill me real fast, but I could kill them real fast. In this one, they can kill me real fast, over and over, end of sentence. The addition of things like blowouts and the one or two new horror areas do a lot to win me back. They are a heavy dose of atmosphere in a game that doesn't want to give you a second to appreciate it. It's because of things like that that I could never just write this game off entirely. There are strengths to it. I think it also looks charming. It's just trying to be a game I don't want to play. Well, that's the end of the video. Thank you for watching it. Hey, here's, here's a little engagement experiment. In the comments below, leave a comment. Maybe rank the stalker games. Do something. I should give you an instruction, I guess. I don't know. You don't have to do any of this, really. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to inconvenience you. Uh, but if you've got the time, like, comment, and s subscribe. Check the description for links to other things concerning my content, like merch and music. Uh, my Twitter, Patreon, my Discord. All these things can be found there. It's a very loud motorcycle. Motorcycles are cool. Love it. Love hearing them right next to my bedroom window. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. And an extra special thanks to... Ailing Uncle, Resurrection, Game Master, Bayard Brown. This deal is getting worse all the time. Nazim Kamalu Ray, Newstime, Karen Mavel, Dark Raptor 86, Oisto, Alexander Sundin, Octo, Alexander Smith, Joseph Zanoni, Dos Days, Charles Marr, Pizza Shift, Daphne Pittendry, Jacob Sewers, Andre Perkins, Matt Bastard, Fart Mother, Carrot, Whip It Out, Turts! Free free plug for Turts, check him out on Twitch under Turts McSquirts, Roebi Somim, Goaty McGork, Ken Dog, Jay, Moonpix, Aubrey, also on Twitch. I shouldn't I shouldn't make this a habit, overcomplicate the credits. Uh Wayne Bristol, Edward Avila, Salvatore Tosti, Stuka Bliat, J L Amin, Nekot the Brave, Ava Nerve, Nate Blanchard, Sergei Voronsov, P. Dizzle, Ophelia Fishwife, A Hanging Chad, Donut Stalker, Simon Murray, Brozuf Jones, Ishanji, Rose, Persian Air, Sornfil, Mad Monty 98, Mirden Emrys. 
Nafi's Hook, Robert Brandon, Technica, Spooky, Mandalore Gaming, David Harpstrite, Dan Cullen, Dazed Clockwork, Brendan McFadden, Travis Houston. Whoops. I got an update on my stalker PDA. There's a blowout coming! Where was I? Travis, Brandon McFadden, Travis Houston, Hannes Jacoby, Big Honk, Tyler Robinson, Robert Scotland, Nunu, M, Nick Timmons, Tommy Steenrod, Alistair Stewart, Junk Food, Robert, Ombud, Hitoshi-san, ZJ, Marcus Chani, Roland, Jordan Balzano, Stever, Tomas Pelican, Brett Weaver, Bishy93, James Bloom, Swood Operator, Fickle Pickle Jar, David Frumke, Teeth, the Teeth, 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 Andrew Light, Commissar, Doxapine, Flastan, Arshus Knight, Spider, Leland Miliokis, Alas Ratgunk, Atlantean Goldfish, Sergei Vidovin, Rowdy Roddy Peeper, Major Millions, Tyler F., Mr. Bujangles, Evo Zap, Alec Galler, Strahinka Redenkovich, Dan Richardson, Fred Gryson, Otter Soldier, Lost Via Domus, Megan Carmody, DJ Necroman, Meme Queen, Jay Marshall, Joe Face, El Jazguar, Sweet Pete, Backseat Esquire, Declan J. Keen, Totally Not a Mimic, Michael King, Petrus Montanu, Q Chan, Jean Philippe Malouin, Nicholas Nelson, Fazy, Vivitis, Ross Armstrong, Byron Callan, Callum May, Grimbeard and Neryl are my two dads, Rourke McKenzie, Austin Scott, Keith Pitt, Brianna Maria McKenzie, Lucas Kettner, Nikita Denisov, Mr. Sark, Dylan Sorum, Daniel Person, Brendan Naftal, Jojo Evans, Colton Rowe, Zubertuber, Sebastian Wappler, Sean Clausen, Omar Eid, Calavera, Bindle, Chris Jordan, Zdienek Benez, Artak, Der Commissar, Colin Boyd, Trenton Wilkins, Big Cheese 1000, David Offert, Scoss 117, Homeboy Dirtbag, Nuan Sonar, Mystical Lint, James Young, Mangy Mongrel, Tyler Long, Crispy, Adam Page, AI, Mike Garza, Yak Spiker, Khalil Corey, Chris Tallarico, Dilda, Spicy Milk Ann, 4 Hour Depression Nap, Nick Hill, Anna Trans Rights XO, Ya Boy Nikki G, Roy Gendron, Pen Knight 89, Volpix Chick, DS Carmen, A League of Struggle, Terranism, Greg Buchold, Arminius J, Smokey Jefferson, F no, I didn't forget about you. Smokey Jefferson, Micah J. Best, INTJ loves her INTP, Yui, Cannon Go Boom, Saidi, Tino Richter, Vargar, Beardicus, Olympus 3DX, Sonata Fanatica, Matt X Ghost, my waifu, Joe Jameson, Eris Alessandrakis, Chris Audi, Lorelei, Ben L, Alex Theodorov, T Stoney, Xanax OD Grindcore Lover, OP Downfall, Edward Crawford, Ursandro, Sidney Steverson, Tax Deductible, Andre Kalganov, Tino, David Moreau, Sir Alohomora, Pedro Costam, Adventure Game Geek, Ghost LPs, Niles Crane 19, Johan Cavand, Adrian Fachi, Christopher White Schneider, Ricky Goss, Pixelfish, Wednesday V, Alex Hanna, Professor Nex, Lucas, Kaz, No Bunny, The Gaming Beehive, Little B, Drunk Taco, Matthias Waltman, Ricky Rigatoni, Robert McMahon, Hashi Singh, Soul Bad Guys Dragon Punch, AJ Leroy, Brad, Anthony Daniel, Sam C, Warhopper, Kevin Thurber, Jeep Pete, Sira Prize, The Voyant Claire, Gargantua, Joe Reynolds, Ignacio de Guglielmi, Melon Man, Level Zero, Sven Grell, Grimbeard but with bananas taped to his hands, OK Cat Dad, Test Done, Yoni Niamela, Homeboy Dirtbag, Crampig Newt, Razzle Dazzle B13, Uncle Dozer TV, Diggity D7187, Canem, Wabuctus, Slavic Dreams, Phony Soprano, Stephen Francisco Santana, The Becker Sattler Clan, Piotr Sankowski, Nameless, Alexis Pinsonalt, Visitor Information, Nicholas Monroe, Gato Malo, Val Halverson, Vincent Cronin, Rith, Sinoise, Seaway Jerk, Christian, Danny Storgard, Alex Stutson, Austin Mathis, Drenched, Odd One Indeed, A.L. Carpenter, Ian Laser, Stephen Laflame, Solar Box, Schluff, Brian Sanson, Nick Hoffman, Just Hugh, Myargar, Half Asian Viking, Sentient Turtle, Yuko Vallis, Silvano Gonzalez, Whiskey Grenade, Adolency, QT, P2T, J Raptor, John Nathan Sede, I don't know about that one either, Av Clemens Karman, The Real Kal El, Huile, 
Games Brit, Cocoon, Slava Shafnenko, Colin Jameson, Baker, Tony Gleed, Lefazar, Bones Malones, Eugene Balder, Zan, Eric Leong, Vukrulez, Nagru, Daniel Newberry, Matt Chester, Sweeneasy, Fitzgerald93, Bim Bizzle, Viet Do, Pentagon Black, Dust Sucker, Conrad Eastman, Oliver Marshall, Luke Gazaway, Furin, Pagan Butler, Icky Fu, Inside My Strange Place, Brandon Shock, Sam Fuller, Cloister56, Yossarian, Allegory, Lucas Mendel, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living, Rasmus Karras, Devaith Faust, Ian, Michael B., John Adams, Ian Baranek, Florian Vogel, Bertie Bertig, Rachel Rose, Vinculus, Avalanche Reviews, Negative Creep, Chris Barb, Sean Lovett, Haimo Statman, Boyi, H.L. Longboy, Manu Weidman, Danny D., Tony Brandt, Joshua Stewart, Curano, Chef Toker, Gideon Joubert, Scott Motuz, Frand, Vey, Peachy Pixel 8, Sir Tristan, Sarah Denman, Stanislav, Casey Ghoul, Zachary Schulstad, Ross Carmona, Kalifas, Sammy 3D, Mikey Tambourine, Schwabalaba, Moral, Daniel Gen, Sean Bradford, Damar, Unpolished Mirror, John Stone, Frantic Atlantic, Jick Magger, Hamish Batten, Mara Alina, Jacob Hanley, Octo, Raul Vidal, Josh Hessler, Cam, Pommy, Nylanthrope, Emilio Hansen, Alex Yui, Prod Mage, Van the Cheesen, Nick Johnson, Franz, Leonardo Antonio Aquasanta, Buckaroo, Who Done It, Bertigan, Dantec K3, Frank, Eric Lawn, Low C, Azroy, The Sid 4, Ziklau, Andre Kurenkov, Edward Wheeler, Someone Finally Pays Me, Ren, Quirky Top Hat, Bitmatter, Love You More, Lauren, Jacob Gardner, Zane Brake, Dead Alewives, Louis Quinn Whalen, Robert Sharnovsky, Emmett Arthur, Pager, PJ, William Riker, Astro Shepard, Pulpode, Vigo Love, Bubblegum Kirapop, Lynn Lovett, Epic Dude 467, Poet Russell, Freaky Demon, Pop Eyed Bark, Tayano Sandman, Ruben, Korn, Red, Ryan Malone, Thy Rourke, Hazel Connor, Perennial Astronaut, J Dog 3433, David Badzinski, Fubar Gubbins, Jalcor, Cryptid John, Joshua McLarnan, Rayo Palmista, Anthony H, Shantiva, Phoenix Flames, James Lambert, Summerstorm, Big Death Energy, Ava Grave Ladova, Will M, Kyle Williams, Kimia, John Brumley, Lauren Miller, Roosevelt Hoover IV, CMG161, Gianni Matragrano. Do I got both of you on here, do I? Cine Selena, Savrvz, could be Sarus, and you're doing like a uh, churches thing. I'm sorry. And 82 Pedro for being a patron. Again, thank you so much. I can't even express how much I appreciate your support. Keep keeping my channel alive and keeping me alive. And uh, thanks for putting up with the uh, influx of supernatural videos. I am endlessly grateful for that. Uh, <laughs> hope you're staying safe. Hope you're staying goth. Hope you're staying gaming. I'll s see you in the next video. Okay, bye. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later.